we ended up going into an asbestos walkout, which was one of the only uh, successful Wildcats in Alberta labor history. I started working in the pulp mill in 1985 as a contractor doing asbestos abatement. And uh, well, my initial, my initial reaction to the conditions in the mill was horror. The company over a, a 10 year period uh, were informing us that they were taking out asbestos, uh, removing the asbestos from the workplace. We found out that they weren't doing it at a you know, fast enough speed for, for our membership. In 1989, I started working for the mill and working in the wood room. And over the next couple of years, I worked my way up to becoming a joint safety committee rep. But I think by 93, it was even just on some of my walks out to the joint safety committee meetings. And on my way out there, I would notice different parts of the mill where there was literally asbestos hanging off the pipes again. So we had all the different types of asbestos in the plant. And especially the powerhouse was particularly bad because the boilers were insulated with it. Steam condensate piping was insulated with it was all over the place. And of course, the walls had uh, the transite paneling and the older buildings were sprayed on with limpet on the inside, about six inches thick. I raised the issue at the Joint Safety Committee. What is our current asbestos abatement program look like? And basically got told, we're, we're done. You know, we got everything out. We're, we're asbestos free. And I remember <laughs> telling them, well, you're far from asbestos free. I mean, I saw a few dozen places where it's in bad shape just walking here. We had documentation. We had brought the issue up at our Joint Safety Committee. Uh, and we're basically getting nowhere with the company. But this uh, person uh, called me to the administration office one night shift I was working and uh, took me in and, and opened a, a back room and took me to a filing cabinet and said, there's the records. And, uh, you know, I got to about the third page in and there's black felt pen right through every line of it. And the last, the last entry was massive dust cloud enveloping area taking monitor and retreating. You know, we'd had incidents where the, uh, the background readings of asbestos in the air was a thousand times the legal limit and instead of evacuating the area they just unplug the machine and say the filter was plugged, we're getting incorrect readings. I think finally after about four months of listening to us, they said, well, what do you propose we do? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'd be willing to do a brief survey of some of the conditions I've seen and try and identify the product, the condition, and, and make a recommendation. After a little bit of reluctance on their part, I guess, they agreed. And so out, out I went. Wow, it didn't take long. I think it was like uh, second day in and I found an air handling unit that was literally insulated with, uh, with an asbestos mortar or mud product and it was on the floor and it had completely degraded. It was just a pile of crumbled product and every time somebody walked in or out of there, which was frequently, uh, this product would be released into the airstream and, and pumped into the uh, the MCC rooms. And in the one case, Dave and I chased the oh &S guy through the entire plant, pointing out asbestos problems. It didn't matter where we went. We knew where this stuff was. Saying, what about this? What about that? Asbestos very bad, don't you know? Well, yeah, we know. And what are you going to do about it? other than having lunch with the company, right? And nothing. Not a thing. We chased the sucker through the whole plant, all the way out to the parking lot, all the way to his vehicle. The guy gets in, shut the door, locked it, gone. At the next month's Joint Safety Committee meeting, I brought back my initial survey, which I think had consisted of almost 200 samples of which approximately 180 were positive for asbestos. 90% of them I deemed to be in unsatisfactory condition and probably 50 or 60 of them in a dangerous condition based on uh, the proximity to somebody's breathing zone, you know, they're opening a valve and they're impacting something right in their face. They got their own consultant to come in and said, you do an assessment, the union did theirs, we want ours. The company guy came back and he said, yeah, you're right, the union was way off. Uh, the problem's at least twice as bad as they said it was. 
Now, one of the parts of educating ourselves on this strategy was trying to figure out how to process an occupational health and safety claim when it came to asbestos. In this particular case, when this member was sick, the local was working with him to try and get proper compensation for the disease. Steve Powers was his name, and he was denied at every level you can imagine. In Steve's case, we actually had to take a piece of his lung, and it was sent to Montreal where, in essence, they burned it. And then what they did was metallurgy on the minerals that were left over and found his lung is composed of 30% asbestos. And it was at that point we were able to establish that, yes, his death was asbestos-related, and yes, it was compensable, and uh, we ended up getting him a uh, a settlement from the Alberta Workers' Compensation Board, which was a huge, huge stride for us, I guess, as a local, because we knew this was happening, but it was really tough to prove. We knew we were on to it, and there was some discussions at the plant level um, where representatives of the company, when we brought to them and said, look, we know this guy is sick. We believe this guy died as a result of it. We know of at least two others we believe have contracted asbestos-related diseases. It wasn't until a lot of the supervisors, our mill supervisors, started contracting asbestosis um, that I think they really woke up to it. I know we lost a supervisor in my department in the Woodroom. This is a guy that once said to me, asbestos, asbestos. Learned the hard way, I guess. Um, contracted asbestosis and died within three months. Uh, this was in four months of retiring. We lost an electrical supervisor to asbestosis within a few months of his retiring. And one of the company's uh, health and safety professionals actually told us, uh, it was a mistake on their part, told us that if we thought it was only gonna be four or five, then we really didn't have a clue what was going on. We had a meeting with some of the executive people and said, look, we, we've got to address this. And following the rules, we got to start labeling. They finally picked a particular weekend where they were going to take these big rolls of labels. So now what they're doing is they're applying the stickers. The people showed up on the Monday morning and there's stickers everywhere. Even from my perspective, knowing what we had found, my initial uh, experience walking back into power and recovery was, wow, I mean, it, it opened my eyes. Because when you take a gray workplace and you plaster it with red, black, and white labels, it was really shocking. And I mean, when you could stand in one place and probably count 200 different areas just from any one spot. And that's when the workers on the floor said, what the hell are you doing? You've lied to us. You haven't told us the truth. We've had enough of this crap. And the place went in the tank. Uh, ironically enough, it was Independence Day, uh, July 4th, when we finally said we'd had enough and, and took the mill down. Um, we had the strength of the legislation, we had the oh &S regulations, and we had our own collective agreement which defined we shall you know, not operate machinery if it places the employee in imminent danger. And so our guys put their foot down and said they're going to do a safe work refusal and refuse to operate the plant until a decision was made about how they were going to get rid of it. They did an orderly shutdown of the power and recovery department, shut down the turbines and the boilers. It took less than a day. We started shutting down, I believe it was a Friday evening at 6 p.m. We came in and told the shift engineer that we uh, were no longer working in these conditions and we were going to begin taking the plant down. Yeah, we got a hold of the executive, I guess, by about 7 p.m. that night. We had executive members coming in. It took us a while to track down the president, and, and we got uh, Don Boucher in, and uh, I think we pulled him off the golf course. He was out enjoying a Friday evening and uh, got him in and said, Don, we got trouble. The mill's going down. Uh, we got a wildcat on our hands, and Don came in, and we had the whole executive in there, and we played some phone tag with the company and their lawyers and our lawyers for a while, and finally at 1 in the morning decided that... Uh, there's no way we're taking our finger off the stop button until we get some resolve to the issue. They got a hold of the Labour Minister and they uh, convened the Labour Board on a Saturday morning just to try and get that mill up and running again. The company has their corporate jet show up now and they've got their corporate people showing up from, uh, from their Human Resources Department in Vancouver. The corporate jet lands. Um, they don't offer us a ride to the city. <laughs> so it's myself and now Don Boucher 
and uh, we've got Don's Jimmy, and we're supposed to be at the labor board in, at 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, we had to find our safety guy, and they found him up at the local pub there at about 3 in the morning and drug him out of the bar and said, come on, Wally, you're coming with us. I knew our guys, and our guys weren't going to just cave in and go back to work because somebody, some suit in the government said so. There was going to have to be some concrete movement uh, in order for the plant to start up again. And I wasn't so sure that that was going to happen, so I took my toothbrush. It's now about 3 o'clock in the morning. We've been up all day, and it's about a three-hour drive. So uh, we zip home, um, you know, put a toothbrush in a bag, not sure if we're going to jail, not sure where we're going to end up come the next morning kind of thing. So a toothbrush and, you know, kiss the wife uh, and tell her we're off to the city. We were brought uh, in front of the board, labor board, um, it was a, it was really a, a long procedure. We were up for, the executive was up for 36 hours straight fighting with the company and the labor board. We're driving into the city. We've got our lawyer on the phone now because now we're trying to put together our case for the labor board. Problem was, the lawyer's offices were locked. The lawyer's in Jasper. The files are in somebody else's office. We're on our way to Edmonton for about a month now. We've been telling them that we had everything documented that we were alleging. We arrived at the steps of the labor board, and I'll never forget this. There's the company representatives, well refreshed. You know, one guy's wearing that silver sharkskin three-piece suit with the leather portfolio. Two of them are, you know, standing with big briefcases right beside him. Our lawyer pulls up in a station wagon and starts unloading these wood, these cardboard boxes of files. We go, oh, hang on, can we help you? Absolutely. So we get a dolly from the labor board, run it down the steps, and we're taking stuff out of our station wagon and putting it in the top. And I'm watching the company representatives, and you can just see on their face, that's the stuff that we've been talking about. Here it is. So we're lifting these boxes, and we're taking them out of the station wagon and putting them on the dolly, and we haul them up the steps one step at a time. It's myself and Don Boucher and the lawyer walking beside us, and we're lifting them up, and we go into our little room that they've got for us. We go, oh, wonderful, you found it. She says, no, I didn't. There wasn't a thing in those boxes. One file about that thick. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> um, but the strategy now, they believed we had the evidence. If we get in front of the labor board, which is public, we get to make all this stuff public. Uh, we actually sat in the, in the labor relations tribunal room or whatever it is. Um, very briefly, and then we were in side rooms, and it was shuttle diplomacy. People coming back and forth, trying to, trying to work something out. We challenged, you know, the assistant deputy minister. She showed up, and she said, what's the issues here? I understand and play the, and we said, your department um, is killing our members because you guys aren't doing your job. They reassigned the occupational health and safety officer as part of that negotiation. They assigned six officers to fly out to Hinton to have a look and see if our allegations were true or not. So we're getting to the short strokes now. We're getting government buying that we've got an issue, the employer understanding that there's certain things we need done, and uh, ultimately it comes in finally now, the Labor Board representative comes in and says, okay, if you guys agree to this, they'll do that, and we'll get this thing resolved. Yes. So they left the room, I called the plant. And I remember getting a phone call and it, it was uh, from, from my boss, the vice president of operations, he says, look, we're gonna phone you guys in a few minutes on a conference call in, in the control room. No matter what comes out of my mouth, you tell me no. You say, screw off, we're not taking it, you know, kiss our ass, we're saying no. So okay, fine, and I brief all the boys in the control room and then the phone call comes, eh, and it's, it's Glenn. Sure enough, the labor board comes in what well, we told them and the representatives from the company and the ADM is there and the OH&S director for the region is there and they said, this is what we've got to offer. And uh, they laid it out, inspectors going up, reassignment of inspectors and uh, we'll go up there and verify whether or not, et cetera, et cetera. I said, okay, that's what we need here. Um, but we also need immunity. <laughs> I mean, no matter what happens out of this, this was in good faith, and oh man, here we go again. You call them and see if they'll go back to work. So I called back to the plant, and I told them, uh, this is the offer that's on the table. Um, are you guys willing to go back to work if we, if we can make this happen? And Calvin comes back with, 
Did they give you immunity? I hadn't even talked to him about that, eh? I go, no. He says, and they can kiss our ass. Slams the phone down on the speakerphone. It was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. I said, well, we got to figure this one out, guys. They came back and they came back and they said, okay, you got immunity put in writing. It's a, a workplace health and safety work refusal. You did it because you believed you were in imminent danger. Now let's go figure it out. Only if those guys agree to go back to work. Pick up the phone and say, we got immunity, guys. They said, okay, then. Do we got what we need to be safe here, Glenn? Yeah, I think we do. We'll figure it out from here. Okay, then we'll start the plant up. The oh and officers beat us back to Hinton. They all flew. We're back in Don's Jimmy now, <laughs> heading back to Hinton. <laughs> Can't believe what we've just been through. We get back to the plant, and the oh and officers were interviewing all the guys. We had uh, the uh, oh and officers come out to Hinton right away and start making demands on the company to start removing the asbestos. We set up an uh, asbestos committee with two union representatives directing the company and where the asbestos should be moved and how it should be removed. We said, no, you know, we can't tell you how much asbestos you've exposed us to in the last 15 years, but we can tell you how much you're gonna expose us to in the next 15, none. I think now more than ever, we have probably one of the smartest workforces when it comes to identification of a hazard and dealing with it. And, and it's not the old, oh, it's asbestos, I ain't doing it. Now it's asbestos, I know how to do it. Through that process, I then went and got my asbestos ticket. I slowly got trained on how to do the inspections. So we got our own people trained on how to identify the asbestos under the microscopes. We got the right equipment in for them so that they could do it. Uh, I was now taking over doing the pre-contaminations and setting up for the jobs, working with the contractor that was actually doing the work, doing the removal inspections. And when we walked away in our mind, it was as best as safe. You gotta keep in mind that we're a, a mill in a mine town. I mean, primarily probably 80% of our jobs are either employed at the mill or the mine or servicing um, employer relationship to one of those industries. And what I think the community learned there is that you can do things, you just don't have to accept status quo, that you can do things to protect your health and safety. The town of Hinton come to us and said that they could have a problem with asbestos and so we sent our asbestos abatement union reps over and they inspected the building. They found out it was just caked with asbestos. And so what they, uh, what they did, they took action right away and got oh &S involved and the, company, the town of Hinton has removed the asbestos. So uh, it, uh, it was really positive. The whole situation around the asbestos was really positive. Somebody called us one time about the old Zellers building and we found asbestos uh, residuals on the kids' toys. The local elementary school, we found uh, an asbestos membrane along the entire roof when they were redoing the roof. We found uh, pipe insulation. The so Hinton General Hospital was another case in question. And I went in and done an inspection and yeah, there's problems. They were heavily involved and they're still involved to this day, uh, which only proves that uh, when the membership starts speaking and, and taking action, and as an executive, uh, executive member representing them, uh, knowing that the, we were in a tough situation that we shouldn't be taking job action to shut down the mill, we had to do it. Um, you don't shut down your employer's business, uh, you know, on a fancy or a whim. It, it was a serious issue. And I think because uh, our guys took that stand, uh, most of them will live a little longer. It uh, turned into one of the uh premier safety shutdowns, I think, in labour history as far as Canada goes. And uh, we shut it down, we got the Labour Board to agree that we were in the right. Uh, the company didn't like it much, but at the end of the day, um, we ended up getting an asbestos task force that's won awards for best practices. Uh, we got a successful abatement program, and 855, I think, got to hold their head up high. Um, you know, we, we stood up on principle, and uh, to me, that's what the labour movement's all about, um, standing up on principle. 